For today's data science chalk talk, let's try to do statistical learning theory or pack learning. Pack learning is a great little acronym. It star stands for probably, approximately, correct. In pack learning, there's the concept we're trying to learn. We have training data, a finite amount. We imagine it is drawn from a possibly infinite family of data, and the concept is a mapping of explanatory variables to a dependent variable. We'll just say y is in true false, so this is binary classification, and all the x's are vectors of real numbers. Training tries to, by examining the data, find an approximation concept. So it tries to learn. Now what we want is the approximation we learn is very near the concept we are trying to learn that generated the data. So PAC says with a low probability, with prob less than or equal to p, the distance of concept to approximate is less than equal to epsilon. p might be 1 1,000th, and epsilon might be something like 3% increase in error rate. So a pack type statement says, with a probability no more than 1 in 1,000, your approximation agrees with the concept except for in all but 3% of the positions. So it may have agreed with the concept everywhere on your training data, but that's not yet evidence it'll agree with the concept everywhere in all data in the world. So this is a little unusual. The normal way we address this is just by splitting our data into training and test and evaluating our model on data that wasn't used during the construction of and hoping that that test data imitates the future infinite data pool it might be applied to. This is actually a little different than overfitting, avoiding overfitting in that way, in that we're going to guarantee mathematically with high probability we have the right concept from our training data. That what we saw in training is probably what's going to go on in the future. Now how do we do that? Well, the only way we can do that is first we have to limit our concept space. Essentially, one way of thinking about training data is it falsifies bad ideas. So we could say, I think it does that. And then there's some training examples that don't work that way. It eliminates those ideas. So we need a lot of training data to eliminate bad ideas. And we need a limited concept space so there's only so many bad ideas to eliminate. So for our example, let's make our concept half spaces in the plane. Very limited concept space, but interesting all the same. So it's a concept, we have a plane, this is the x-coordinate, this is the y-coordinate, different use of the word y there, and a possible concept is the it, points we're interested in are all on this side of this straight line. We are limiting only to straight lines, we can position them anywhere at any angle, but we are limiting only to straight lines. So under that rubric, training data, so let's not call this y, let's call this the uh, value. So we have x, y, which are our explanatory variables, and we have v, remember, true, false, that we're trying to predict given knowledge of x and y. This data can come in in tabular format. And there might be a lot of it. Let n be the number of rows. And again, we can present the same data graphically. So 1, 3, false. 3, 1, true. So these are similar presentations. And as we've claimed, there's a concept that reproduces the effect on training, it says the trues are all on this side of this half space. 
Now, there are concepts that are unlearnable to this representation. For instance, here's one. Again, we're in the plane. There's no line that separates this F as a half space from all the trues. No matter how we cut, we always, the side that has F has some trues in it, maybe at least one. And that's actually a geometric fact that we don't have time to prove here, but there is no set of four points in the plane that can be separated by a half space. It's not just that this one fails, any set of four or more points fail. So this is a happy set. We can separate this concept. So the set of size three is shatterable. Shatterable means that if we abstract out the labels, so this is a representation of this set. It's these three points, that for any assignment of true and false to these points, we can find a concept that separates them. For instance, if this was true and true and false, different assignment than this, but the exact same three points, well, there's a different, there's a different concept from our concept space that performs the separation. And we call this set shatterable with respect to our concept space Again, if for any subset, there's a concept that finds that subset. It's not always the same concept. We have to move which plane we're picking, but it's always from our concept space. And it turns out, I mean, obviously there are some sets of three points that are not shatterable. For instance, we could just stack them all on top of each other or put them in a line. Both of those are not shatterable. But there is a set of size three that's shatterable. Just put them in general position in a triangle. But there is no set of size 4 that's shatterable. It's not just that this one's not shatterable by a line, half space, no set of four points are. Something always goes wrong. That requires a proof. But the last size that is shatterable is the VC dimension, by definition. And that is named after Vladimir Vapnik and Alexei Chernovinkis. So VC dim, last sized set, we can find a shatterable example. If we can shatter arbitrarily large sets, um, we call it an infinite dimensional VC space. Like if our concept was nearest neighbor, that has infinite dimension, even in the plane. So VC dimension is last size set we can shatter. It's basically a a numeric or quantitative representation of how limited is our concept space. Now, how are we able to use that? The way we're able to use that is through the Pajor's reformulation of the perlis sauer Sheila lemma. Now, this is a lemma about sets, not about geometry, so we no longer need any knowledge of geometry to do this, and it's a little abstract. But it basically says, look at our n here, if we can, every single concept from our concept space splits our data set into two pieces, the pieces on one side and the pieces on the other. So each concept splits this data set into two pieces or two subsets. If we list every possible subset that this can be split into, we get a list of all the subsets we can access by this concept space. Now, a system of n rows has 2 to the n subsets. The sauer Sheila lemma, just I'm shortening the names to the more common ones, says that actually if your um, VC dimension is bounded by k, then you can only get to about n to the k over k factorial subsets. Now in our case, k equals 3, so we can only get to n to the third over six subsets. So certain subsets of our data set cannot be identified by our concept thing. It's basically saying it's just like this. There's certain sets of points that sail together. Now, the thing is, 
This is much smaller than this. It's saying 2 to the n grows much faster than n to the third. For instance, if n was 100, well, 2 to the n, 100, 100 to the third is about 10 to the, is 10 to the sixth. 2 to the 100th is about 10 to the 30th. So 2 to the 100th is astronomically larger than n to the third over the sixth. So it says, this lemma says that if you're generating your subsets not by enumerating every possible subset, but only by the ones that can be found by different instances of your concept space. So we are iterating through our concept space. It's not any one concept splits these sets up. It's all the concepts together. Just run them all, record every subset ever written down on this data set. At most, it can build n to the third over six subsets for k equals three. In general, it's k here. So that's very specific and very small. Now, there's an argument as to why that follows, but that's, again, a theorem. The Sauer-Sheila lemma, in particular, the um, Pedro reformulation of it. So how do we use that profitably? Well, this is the core of statistical learning theory. The idea is we have all these subsets. And yes, some of them overlap, some of them don't. So we've cut up our data set into all these subsets, and many of them overlap. In them. But let's just look at one for a little bit. What happens is, as n grows large, we're going to grow n. Some fraction of the training data arrives in our little subset. And what, how many there are, since it's a fraction, grows linearly as our data set grows. So the data starts arriving into our little subset. Now, we need one more concept, hoofding bound. And I have to look up whether he has one or two Fs every single time, and it is two. So Hoofding's inequality, or at least the form I want, says the following. If we are measuring what fraction of these points are true versus false, because that is our dependent outcome variable, then, and if x bar is our measurement of that, it's what's the average value of true versus false seen in this one subset, then the probability that x bar observed minus the unknown true value of x, put absolute values around that, is less than or equal to 2 times e to the minus 2n epsilon squared. So, our odds of being far away from the true value, so if we think this is a 30% true subset, the odds of that being wrong go down exponentially in n. So on one subset, the degree of mistake that is probable becomes very, very small very fast. Or more correctly saying it, if we lock in what degree of mistake we're allowing, the odds of making that mistake decrease incredibly fast. So we treat what degree of mistake we're making as a fixed quantity. Treat epsilon as a fixed quantity. So what goes wrong in machine learning isn't so much your model fails when you put it into production. That is what you experience. But what happened is your model overperformed in training. That you picked a set that you thought was good because it looked good during training, but it won't be good in the future. So basically, it's, it's not so much the model underperforms in production, but it overfit and overperformed in training and lied to you. So the odds of any one set experiencing an overperformance fall exponentially fast in N. Now, the worst thing, what, now we want to relate that to the odds of any set failing. So this is one set failing. The error is bigger than we hoped. What are the odds of any set failing? Well, if I'm going to drive my car and my car not working is going to ruin my day, and the two ways my car can fail is the battery's dead or a tire's flat, the way the battery and the tire can conspire to make my day worse is not fail on the same day. So if they each have a 1% chance of failing, the way they maximize their pain to me is they agree to fail on different days. So this, the tire's 1% failure rate isn't confounded with the battery's 1% failure rate, so they together get a joint 2% failure rate that at least one of them failed. That's called the union bound, and it makes sense. If, if the odds of any one component failing are no more than uh, 2 e to the minus 2 n epsilon squared, then the odds of any component failing are bounded above by 
n to the third over 6, how many components times the odds of each component failing bounds, in general, the odds of any component failing. And now we're actually done. This might start out as a ginormous or large quantity due to this horrid n to the third, but if we continue to drive n up, this term goes up, which is bad. We are seeing more and more partitions that we're responsible for correctly estimating. However, this term is falling much, much faster. Because here n is in an exponent, the negative, here n is just a polynomial, just n to the third. So for a certain bound, and again, this is the probability of seeing any failure on any set whatsoever. So for any given desired rate of failure, there's an n such that this quantity is very much below it, saying if we train on that set of data, limiting ourselves to the concept space that had the VC dimension of 3, or k in general, then with this probability, we cannot fail with more than this probability, that the amount of excess generalization error will be bounded by our requirement epsilon by at least this probability. And yes, this formula is very sensitive to epsilon. If we make epsilon smaller, the data set size required does get larger. Um, is, in fact, it's this, roughly the square of epsilon because it comes out of the exponent. It's fighting n in the exponent. So that's, uh, epsilon is something we're very vulnerable to, which is why we need to consider it a fixed um, quantity that we don't insist be too very small, but n works really, really well. And that is pack learning, that basically in pack learning, concepts seem to be simple. If they're simple, they don't divide data sets into very many sets. In fact, they divide them into surprisingly few data sets. Once you know you have surprisingly few ways to fail, then a simple bound on one way to fail quickly becomes a bound on any way to fail, and therefore, when you fail to fail, you succeed. And this beautiful uh, setup, again, is called statistical learning. It's also under the nomenclature pack learning. And I, I hope you enjoyed that little background. It's a different way of thinking about machine learning problems. Thank you for your time.